Communication is about survival. And the best communicators, in my opinion, are those people that have had to survive something. And in other, and in other words, had a bit of a tough upbringing. I always think that the most um, competent salespeople are tough, resilient people, kind of had, had a bit of a tough upbringing. They're quick, got to be agile. So I think there's a certain amount of it is life experience. And then obviously, you know, these skills can be taught. And so you add that to it. You're good at what you do. I, I was a good communicator, I think, but I didn't know what I was doing. And then someone showed me what I was doing and it made me better because I could do it when I wanted to rather than do it by instinct. So was it the environment that you grew up in that really helped you acquire some of these skills? Well, I was born and bred in Brixton in London, which is a, a pretty tough area. And it was a tough area in the 50s when I was brought up there. And you learn to know who not to fight. You learn to know who not to upset. And I think it was a lot about that. So it's, it's, it is very instinctive. You kind of think, mm, OK, I'll be careful here because if I'm not careful, this person could do me some damage, that sort of thing, you know. So it's that. So you become very quick and, and you think, pick up situations. You begin to recognize very early on, is this person going to fight me or is this person just shouting at me? Because there's a big difference between the two. They call it emotional intelligence. I think, in essence, all emotional intelligence is about is survival. Can I survive this situation? And what should I do in this situation? Should I fight or should I run? Or should I just stay still? So I think that's the core of my skills come from there, without a doubt. Why is listening so important? Why should we all seek to become better listeners? Oh, I think without a doubt, it's the core of all communication. There's nothing else. Everything else depends on good listening. If you want to have a brave conversation, a fearless conversation, if you want to have an awkward conversation, if you want to do a negotiation, if you want to do anything, the first thing you've got to do is understand the other person and you'll never understand that other person by talking at them. You can only ever do it by listening. Listening is the core of everything. And as we've discussed and when you went on the course, most people have no idea how to listen. And that's why I think it's such a thing that we should be teaching everybody to listen properly. Yeah, for sure. There's a quote by Stephen Covey in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he talks about as humans, we tend to listen to reply instead of listening to understand. Absolutely. And, and most of the time we're listening to the words and we're not really listening for the meaning. The words and the tone of voice put together give us the meaning of what's really going on behind. And once you get to that, you, and you can guess at it really easily, but you've got to listen for it. You've got to understand what's driving these words. You know, the context, you're in the context, whatever the situation is, you need to know what's going on behind the words. And you'll only get that by listening to them. You'll never get it by talking to people. Yeah, I find it strange how throughout my school years, there's been more of a focus on on talking and being a good speaker and there's not been that much emphasis on on listening whereas mm -hmm. when it comes to relationships being a good listener is a desirable trait to have so why do you think it is that we are in that situation as, as a society it's is it because listening is seen as being too emotional maybe I absolutely agree with you, I, I, and, and I feel foul of this myself when I'm younger, you know, you, we're all taught to ask questions, uh, speak up for yourself, you know, get yourself heard, all of those things. You, you never ever have anyone say to you, just listen carefully to what's being said. And a lot of people don't know what listening is, they don't know what to listen for, so I think we're not taught it because people haven't really thought about it in, in, in that depth, shall we say, you know. I think. Um, Every school child should be taught to listen properly, to really understand what's being said. And you need to do it from a very early age. We, we teach people to talk. There's lots of classes on speech making, debate in societies. I've never yet heard of a listening society. You know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me because to be a really good debater, to, really, to be, have a really good debate, to be a really good speech maker, you've got to understand your audience. And if you understand your audience, you're not gonna do it by talking at them. You have to do it by listening to them. And so how can you start to make a speech without understanding the audience you're going to make the speech to? It doesn't make any sense. But people do. They just write a good speech. They stand up. Who are you talking to? How are they going to approach this speech? You know, how do they feel about this? Are you trying to inspire them? Are you trying to motivate them? What are you trying to do? And we're all taught to talk. No one's taught to listen. Yeah, that's interesting. I think there's a lot of people who are in pain or they have anxiety or depression and I think society tells us that we need to speak up when we have these problems whereas if we were better at extracting this information from people we'd be able to help people in a better way and sometimes maybe people have reached out but because we haven't listened to understand 
we don't dive any deeper. And I think having these skills can actually help society in a massive way. A lot of times is what happens is someone's got pain or they're having difficulty and we come up with solutions um, because we've dealt with that pain before or we've dealt with that difficulty before. And then we, we immediately say, well, you should do this. But the reality is that they're not you, they're not me. I, I can't tell you what to do. I have to listen really carefully to why it's having that particular impact on you. Then having understood that, then and only then can I really start to come up with a solution with you. And most of the time, the solution will come from you, providing I listen for it. And sometimes it needs a bit of a tweak and sometimes you may, maybe you don't want to do that, maybe you want to do this. But most of the time, the solution is there. People never come to you with a problem that they haven't thought about solving. If your computer goes wrong, you don't go straight to the mechanic and say, tell me what's wrong with my computer. You switch it on and you switch it off in the hope that it fixes itself. Everybody tries to solve a problem first and then they go, look, but you've, got, you've got to listen to them. You've got to listen to them. So what makes a good negotiator? Well, first and foremost, you've got to be fairly resilient. Don't criticise the man that stands in the arena. You know, the critic sits on the outside looking in, but the man stands in the arena and takes part. And I think with hostage negotiators, you know, there's a lot at stake and, and it's emotionally quite draining, you know, and it's, especially if you lose somebody, you know, then, it, then it's even more draining. But so I think first and foremost, you've got to be fairly resilient. Then you have to be able to be a good listener. You've got to be able to listen because the people you're dealing with, you, often you don't like them and, and certainly don't agree with what they're doing, but you can't afford to let that emotion come out in your voice. You know, you can't afford to, because a lot of the time, especially in hostage situations, all you've got is your voice or so, or so all you've got to use you listen with your ears and you you've got to make that voice reasonable and then mental agility i think is the other one you've got to be fast because you don't have a lot of time to respond they don't give you any time to respond so you've got to be mentally agile so a good listener mentally agile and resilient you know be prepared to be abused because you're going to be abused because that's another thing i want to touch upon was the time constraint that you have because we can apply some of these listening skills in the workplace or at home and we have time to work on that and to extract the information whereas in your situation you don't have much time on your hands so how do you deal with that time pressure you have to build a relationship very fast you have to build some sort of trust very fast and then you have to be prepared to take your time I always think it's a bit like being a comedian where um, if you get the punchline at the right moment, everybody laughs. And if you don't get the punchline at the right moment, it, the joke falls flat. You have to uh, judge the moment when you're going to make that appeal or whatever. You never know how long they're going to take. The shortest one I ever took was two and a half minutes and the longest was it went on for four weeks. So you, you just don't know the time it is. You just have to listen and think, well, hang on. Can I use that now or not? You know, and so it's, so it's very difficult, really. And how much planning do you do before and or are you thrown straight into the deep end sometimes? Do you not have much information to go with? Yeah, the suicide interventions often are very quick, so you don't have a lot, great deal of time for planning. But how much planning do we do? As much as we can. That's the reality. If you've got time, you're planning all the time. There's no we don't call it downtime when you're negotiating, you call it development time. And that's that's the key word. There's no resting. You know, once once that phone goes down, you're practicing, you're thinking, you're trying to build some sort of tactic or strategy. But all of those things are great, except of course, as soon as you pick up the telephone and the person doesn't say what you expect them to say, you're back to square one. And that's where the mental agility comes in. But you're planning and planning and planning and planning in the hope that you get the planning right. And has there been any situations where you've been given the wrong information and it's leading you astray even from the person you're negotiating with right oh i think i think yeah i think that there's there's obvious you know they they try and have you over in all sorts of different ways but a lot of the time you're not quite sure why they're doing it there's there doesn't seem to be a reason and so you kind of you're fishing in the dark really you're putting forward ideas putting forward suggestions you know you use i get the impression all of those sort of things and you're thinking what is this about and then suddenly you'll say something or they'll say something and you think, that's what it's about and then so you, you initially you can be going completely down the wrong angle because you've heard something that you think is is where the problem is and actually it's the other way and so it's not so much you give the wrong information it's just that they've gone off on a track and it's not really about that at all so can you take us through some of the techniques you use or the different phases of a negotiation 
Yeah, all, all communication follows a, a similar route map. Um, and, and the first one, of course, is preparation and planning. You have to do your preparation and planning where you can. And, and that preparation and planning is a constant throughout. So it's before the first meeting, before the investigation, etc., etc. And then, then it follows, everything follows. So there's a first meeting where you've got to make the right impression. You know, and, and if you get the trust right, you get the trust at that time, you start to get likeable. So that's the first meeting. It can be in there, you, you can do all sorts of things, but that's really the key. Then you go into the investigation phase, and that phase is basically trying to find out what it's all about, why we're here, and if possible to find out, you know, the kind of motivators that's full, made them be there on that day. Then you come to the proposal stage. The proposal stage, their proposal in a, in a suicide intervention, of course, is that death is better than life. Our proposal, of course, is that life is better than death. And so you've got to come up with a counter proposal to their proposal. So that's where the investigation is really useful because you've got to think, oh, okay, that's what they're saying. That's why they're there. How can I make that work to, or to my advantage or turn it around to my advantage? Then you come to the bargaining phase, which is what a lot of people call negotiation. And then finally you do the review. And the review is when you, you know, you think, okay, what's gone right, what's gone wrong. And you can do that in between negotiations. So if you have if you've got maybe five negotiations in this particular deal, then after the first one you're saying, right, where are we? Where have we gone right? What we don't like, what we don't like, etc. And that's they're the five they're the five steps. And it, and you just have to keep thinking, where am I on these steps, you know, and what what do I need to, you know, to fill in the other bits and pieces? So that's it. It's, it's every communication you do. If you're going to go in to have an awkward conversation with somebody or a difficult conversation or you've got to discipline somebody, exactly the same thing. First meeting, get that right. You've done your investigation. You know all about that. You know what the person's like. Then you're going to put forward your proposal. Then you get to the button, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's important to point out that when we hear negotiation, we kind of think that it's to do with business, it's striking some sort of deal. But in reality, we're actually negotiating on a daily basis, whether it's with our managers at work, with our partners, with our kids. So negotiation is actually a key part of our lives. And if we don't brush up on those negotiation skills, we can get taken advantage of whenever someone says I want or I need, you're essentially in a negotiation. Absolutely. If you think about, um, let's say you want to take your partner on holiday, you know, and you'll think, but you want to go on a particular holiday but you want your partner to go with you. And so you think, well, okay, I want to do scuba diving. Let's just say we want to do scuba diving. But you know that your partner doesn't like scuba diving. So it's not a very good start, but let's work on that basis. So, you, so now you understand the person, you think, actually, but they do like doing this, this, and this. Right, so if I can arrange a holiday where they can do this, this, and this, then I can do some scuba diving at the same time. And so you start to plan it properly. So you're thinking, right, this is going to give their, this person a really good holiday. And at the same time, I'm going to have a really good holiday and able to do some scuba diving as well. It's that kind of preparation planning. Rather than try and convince someone they should go scuba diving when they don't like it. You know, don't, don't ever invite me to go skiing. I'm not going to go skiing. It's cold, it's wet, it's miserable, and I break my leg. You know, I don't want to go skiing. But if you wanted me to go to a nice place where I can maybe walk in the mountains, where I can visit a few old cities, all the time you're off skiing, then that's fine, I'll do that. You know, so, so plan it around. You've got to convince me that this is a good holiday for me, not a good holiday for you. And how about some of the, the skills that you taught me on the course, like echoing, summarizing, mirroring, is that some of the active listening skills? Can you talk, talk about some of those? Yeah, I think the active listening skills are really useful and they're also vital, but they're not listening. I think that's the trouble. You talk about, well, you're talking about our echoing, you know, instead of actually asking a question, you can just repeat back a key word in the sentence, you know. I was feeling really vulnerable, just repeat vulnerable. You know, and then of course behind vulnerable, there's a story and they will tell you that story. Stop asking too many questions, just say, and go on, tell me more. Those sort of things, you know, so all of those are available. But again, notice they're not listening. And even when you're summarizing back what the other person has told you to make sure you've heard it properly, all you're doing is you're repeating back their words or you can repeat back their meaning, but it's still their words. That's not the listening part of it. The listening is hearing the words, the repeating back is the talking part of it. And that's where the key comes in. I think that's where a lot of people make, that's the problem. When people are told about active listening skills, they think they're listening because they're using those skills. They're not. They're keeping the other person talking. Yeah. But I guess it's about trying to get to the underlying values and beliefs, right? To understand yeah. their motive. Because yeah. a memorable moment for me in that course was on the last day where we had to apply those techniques that you taught us and we got into pairs. And 
my partner was asking or was listening and I was doing the talking and I was just surprised at how much I talked and how very little he asked me. So using those techniques, I was actually getting down to the emotions. And this is someone that I don't really have a close relationship with. I haven't talked to him about these things, but it was just crazy to see how powerful that is that you can uncover a lot from a person without even asking much yeah no, absolutely i think that's the key is that you don't the, the more you the more questions you ask the more roots you give them so imagine if i say to you you know tell me what you did at the weekend and you said oh, i went to the football match the temptation is to say so who did you watch and already i've moved you away from what you were talking about the weekend the original question was tell me about the weekend now I'm telling you, I'm asking you about a football match. And if I support one of the teams or you, you know, you can imagine that, that we never hear about the weekend. We hear about a football match. Mm-hmm. Well, that's two hours of the weekend. That's all it is. But what happened to the rest of the weekend? You know, and, and that's, you know, I think that's the key is if you ask a really good open question and shut up and listen to the answer. Yeah. But I think that's the key. And, and of course, the active listening skills enable you to keep the person talking without asking questions. Just adding to that, now that we're living in a more virtual world and digital world where we're having to communicate virtually and remotely, how do we connect with people? Because it makes it, it makes connecting with people even more difficult, especially when communication is supposed to be 10% words, 30% sound, 60% body language. So when that body language is taken away, how are we going to connect with people with the current situation and moving forward. I think the thing about body language is just rubbish anyway. I've I've never, I've never believed that for one second. I think that's just nonsense. If I wanted to negotiate, I'd much prefer to negotiate over a telephone um, because I can then concentrate on the words. The words are most important. Mm -hmm. You have to listen harder. I think that's the key. You know, you've got to listen harder, but it's always best if you can communicate with the person and see the person because you get some insight into the way they may be feeling albeit tone of voice and words will tell you much more but the, but I think I th- I, not so much it's about communication it's about touch I've been uh, living now on my own for six weeks and I think the thing I miss the most because I talk to people like yourself I talk to you know talk to my family um, so I think it's touch the thing that surprised me is how much I've missed being touched and I don't mean you know <laughs> anything like that just I mean just having that physical contact with somebody I think that's the thing that surprised me yeah. the most because talking down the end of the screen, you're looking at a screen and you can see all the body language on the screen. So it's not, that's not so difficult, but it's, um, it's just not the same. Yeah. There's no, no warmth. There's no energy. I suppose that's the thing. I think when, I, when I'm running a class, as you know, you know, I love the energy of the class mm-hmm. and I kind of push a lot of energy in and I suck a lot of energy back from the class, you know, and it keeps me going. That energy, there's the buzz that goes on in that classroom is such good fun. And when you don't have that, I mean, I'm doing some virtual workshops now and it's really difficult. It's very different because you're just looking at a screen and there's no energy coming back off you. So, yeah, hard, hard. Listen, just listen. The little slips they make, they just make little slips. Just listen hard. Another thing I want to ask you is, as humans, we're quite irrational, especially in anger. So we tend to become quite stupid when we're angry. And you've probably dealt with a lot of those situations and and we have cognitive biases. So each individual is slightly different. How do you deal with that? You have to accept, you're absolutely right. The point you make is absolutely right. Every individual is different. This idea that you can walk in somebody else's shoes is, is another thing that I think is just badly misunderstood. To be able to understand somebody, be able to walk in somebody's shoes, you don't walk in someone's shoes you can't walk in their shoes you have to listen to understand why this particular thing is having this particular impact on people okay let's have a look at covid again go back to covid 19 and you're saying what's happening now is some people are finding themselves at home and they're loving it or they may not be loving it as much as they would but they're having a great time because they're kind of getting lots of things to do they're sorting out the house blah 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 other people are sitting there thinking oh god you know i'm on my own i'm terrified so it's exactly the same situation but look at the difference in the impact. And you've got to understand why this is having that impact on that person. Because if you're the person that's having a good time, you say, what's the matter with you having a good time? Do this, do that, do this, do that. And, and you're kind of doing the best you can, but actually you've got no idea what it's like for that person. So every single person is unique. Every single person is unique. You need to understand that person 
no one else, that person. And you'll only ever understand that person if you listen to what they tell you. And I just want to know whether these skills come naturally to you, the listening, or whether you have to keep reminding yourself. Because for me, ever since the course, I, I keep having to remind myself when I want to do it. But with yourself, is that different or does it come naturally? No, no, exactly the same, exactly the same. I'm listening carefully now to your questions, thinking, <laughs> right, how am I going to answer this question? No, that's fair. You know, if I was having this conversation in the pub with you or something like that, we'd probably, it'd be similar sort of stuff, but it'd be much more casual. But no, no, absolutely. These skills are there for you to use. You know what they are now. You have a huge advantage because you know what they are. You know how to use them. Now, you can switch them on and off as you wish. If you're going into an important meeting, you address it slightly differently to having a chat with me down the end of the telephone. You know, it's a completely different context. But you can switch them on. What's interesting, I don't know if you found this, but someone will be talking to you and you're having a normal conversation and they'll say something and you go, oh, what's that about? And there's that moment where you suddenly switch it on almost. It becomes, oh, hang on. And you want to find out a little bit more about what they just said. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's when I think the skills become, when you've got a good set of skills, is when you're just having a chat like this and you think, oh, hang on, let me just, come here, tell me about that, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And I think that comes, but it only ever comes with practice. So what has been your biggest observation after talking to all these CEOs and big corporations? What do they have in common or what is the key ask that they're looking for? They're all looking for an edge. I mean, that's the key. They're, they're, they're all looking for an edge. But most business just goes by quite happily normally. It's every day, run of the mill. If you say to somebody, tell me the 10 best businessmen you've heard of, they'll come up with 10 names, but they'll struggle. If you ask them for 50, they have no chance. And that's the interesting thing. You think about the population of the world, and we can only talk about, say, 10 or 20 top business people. You know, and that's, to me, and they're different. And why are they different? And they have an edge. And I think a lot of it is because they really understand people and business and how the two work together. And I think the moment you get to that level where you kind of really centered thinking, well, I'm going to understand you so I can see where I can go, then I think that, that makes a difference. The edge is, is communication skills. They call them soft skills. It's just not true. What can we all start doing from today to become better listeners? Oh, enjoy yourself. First and foremost, people are funny. People are great. Uh, no, I love people. I mean, it's so, there's such good fun to be around. I mean, I miss being around people, just enjoying them and, and seeing them doing crazy things. They're fabulous. So first and foremost, just enjoy people. Uh, listen, you know, if the taxi driver wants to talk to you, just talk to the taxi driver. What's the big deal? You know, let them talk to you and listen to them. Just work them out. Um, if if you're, someone's on their mobile in the phone, oh, well, so what? Listen to their conversation. If they're talking loud enough for me to hear, I'm only polite enough to listen to it. I, don't get upset by people. Enjoy them. You know, and the more you enjoy them, the more you see the incredible um, variety of people that are out there. And then you just work them out as you go along. So you practice, talk to the cashiers in the blooming supermarket. You know, just get to like people. Talk to the waiters in a restaurant. Just get them chatting, find out about them. My one tip to everybody is this, be interested, not interesting. 